safety. So this is really important for um, showing just the work that we are able to do and the impact we are making. And so I'm delighted to be talking to you very briefly. And of course, for so many of you realize that uh, our future uh, depends on the quality of the scholarship, the impact you make. Uh, and this is a starting point, I'm delighted to hear about. Even going back to our roots uh, for Florence Nightingale, of course, as many of you know, started work on statistics and research in her own way. So we have come uh, a full circle 200 years later of being uh, so important uh, research to what we do and how we think, particularly at our school, because we have uh, a unique arrangement here of working with nurses and non-nurses collaboratively to really bring some of the best minds we can assemble to help both our presenters today, but also for the scholars and researchers for the future to really make an impact on healthcare. And this is what makes the uh, distinctiveness of the Betty Irie Moore School of Nursing. And I'm really excited to be listening to the presentations today. I also have to recognize to get everybody to this point has taken a lot of effort, not just the individual's scholarship and all those sleepless nights and worries and all those things I'm sure they'll talk to you about at some point, but also the families of folks to, um, who have helped, but also the infrastructure. It actually does take a, a small group of people, uh, a lot of work to get folks to this point. And today we're going to see the culmination of a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. Obviously, this isn't the way we'd normally do it. This is the time for us to normally come together and talk over posters and, and ask questions in real life. But you know, as, as we are adapting, and certainly Becky are in more school has shown itself really adept at being able to challenge uh, the norms and move forward. This is our way to really help everybody uh, present their work in the best light possible. And I'm delighted to be here. And uh, Janice, uh, uh, please introduce our folks today. I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, hearing their presentations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Kavanaugh. And thanks to all of you in the audience who have joined in to hear from our scholars. Each of the four speakers in the session will have about 10 minutes to present a summary of their dissertation research. And I want you all to understand that's 10 minutes to present something that took almost four years to complete. So we've really given them all quite a challenge. After each of the presentations, we'll have about five minutes of questions and answers. And if you would like to participate and ask a question, you can do it at any time. You just click on the Q&A button, you enter your question, and then you hit send. And if you're a panelist in the, um, in the system, then you would need to use the chat function instead of the Q&A function. And then what I'll do is look at all the questions and read them to the speakers after the presentations. And understanding that we have limited time, we may not get to all of your questions, but we will try. So I want you to also know that we love questions from family and friends as well as from students, faculty and staff. So please everyone participate. To get started, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Holt. Her dissertation is titled, Mixed Messages, The Portrayal of Adolescent Girls' Emotional Distress in Popular Culture. And her dissertation chair is Esther Carolina Apazoa Varano. Jennifer. Good morning. I need to be able to share my screen here. <laughs> it says that it's disabled, Jenny. There we go. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Well, good morning. Once again, my name is Jennifer Holt. I'm a nurse and PhD candidate, and it is a privilege to be able to share my research with all of you this morning. I wanna speak with you about a pandemic that we're currently facing. One that takes a life every 40 seconds globally and for every person that loses their life, another 20 individuals will come close to dying. I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm speaking about our current mental health crisis and deaths from suicide. Suicide, a preventable death, is at an all-time high in the United States for adolescent girls. And that brings us to my dissertation research. I'm gonna discuss with you adolescent girls' emotional distress. And what do I mean by emotional distress? I mean depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and suicidal attempt. 
In 2016, suicide became the leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34. But girls and women suffer the brunt of the mental health epidemic. Gender differences in depression diagnoses and symptoms start to emerge between the ages of 12 to 13. And girls outnumber boys in self-harm at five to six times greater between the ages of 12 to 15. And by the time a young woman reaches the age of 18, she is twice as likely to experience depression as compared to her male counterparts. Adolescent girls remain a vulnerable and underserved population in healthcare research. And I'd like to underscore the importance that media and popular culture play in the lives of adolescent girls. They are powerful influences to the identity construction of this population. So what do we need to keep studying this for? I, as I previously discussed, we know that there's an association between gender and depression but there are inconsistent findings reported regarding racial and ethnic disparities in adolescent depression, as well as other identities such as class and sexual orientation. We don't have enough information on that. And also there's been vast changes in the social environment in the United States within recent years. And so exploring and identifying those sociocultural influences among adolescent girls is crucial. The goal of my research was to critically examine how emotional distress and self-harm were portrayed in popular culture magazines targeting adolescent girls. And I did that by conducting a qualitative content analysis. And this uh, method relies on archival documents such as magazines. So this is non-living pre-existing data, making it an unobtrusive way to study this population. And I utilized a feminist intersectional approach. And why this matters is because feminists tend to ask different kinds of questions than other researchers might, such as um, who holds the power in a certain situation? And um, in addition to gender, how does race, class, sexuality, disability, and religion uh, play into it? And we know as fem uh, feminist intersectional theorists, um, know that these are multiplying oppressions and so they overlap and um, increase distress for individuals. The sample that I used is 25 separate issues from four different magazines that were published between January 2018 to January 2019 and they are 17, Girls Life, Sessie, and Teen Graffiti. Some of the magazines are available both digital and print uh, and others are print only. I'm going to share with you uh, mostly today my findings from just one chapter, just a small sliver of my research um, for my chapter titled, It's Hard Being a Girl. The magazines portrayed an overwhelming amount of time, oh, excuse me, let me back up. The three themes I'm going to share with you are hyperconnectivity, lack of safety, and toxic masculinity. And again, these findings are within the context of emotional distress for girls. First, we'll start with hyperconnectivity. The magazines portrayed an overwhelming amount of time that girls spent posting, reading, liking, sharing posts and photos on social media. The daily routine of one young woman named Emma was summarized in an article about Snapchat. It says that she gets up at 6.30 a.m. and focuses on choosing an outfit that would look good enough or cute enough for a streak. By 8 a.m., she's in the car on the way to school and she spends a 35 minute drive debating on whether to send a selfie or a blank screen to a bunch of friends on Snapchat. Once she makes her decision, she spends the remainder of that drive editing the pic and sending it out to her streaks, all 173 of them. Emma described a physical reaction that she would have after losing some of her streaks if she didn't keep them up daily. She said, I would get this hot, annoyed feeling not exactly nervousness or anxiety, this new kind of scary feeling. In addition to peer pressure on social media, there's media pressure in general with the constant flow of news headlines that are posted and reposted over and over again on each social media and news application. There were several accounts of girls of color reporting the distress that they feel related to the police violence that they'd heard about specifically on social media. A 16-year-old African-American woman with a history of depression and anxiety said that she became heavily active on social media during the summer of 2014 when an unarmed teen, uh, Mike Brown, was shot and killed by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. 
She went on to explain that her depression worsened after seeing these events unfold on social media. She said, I got exposure to a lot of social issues and it was depressing to realize and see everything that was going on. I'm still trying to figure out how to have a healthy relationship with social media, being aware of things, being compassionate, but not letting it consume you and keep you in a constant rage. The issue of safety or the lack thereof was another source of great distress for young women. The focus in the magazines was primarily on gun violence. School shootings were mentioned often in all four magazines, along with neighborhood violence and police officers using deadly force. One article advised readers to get familiar with their school's plan for a shooting incident in order to decrease the girl's anxiety. Ariana, 12-year-old girl, explained, we do lockdown drills, but we don't do enough to actually make us feel safer. The reality that gun violence is not only a fear that girls experience in their schools, but also one that they experience in their neighborhoods and even in their homes has been overshadowed by the more recent school shootings in which middle-class whites have been predominantly affected. Some young people feel forgotten about and ignored. One young African-American woman said, I always feel on edge. I've had to duck and dodge bullets my whole life. Sometimes my community is treated like a stereotype, like because it's diverse, it's normal for us to be violent. It's not normal. It's good that after a school shooting, everybody comes together and stands up, but they should have been standing up a long time ago. People around me have been dying for a while. In all four magazines analyzed, misogyny and rape culture pervaded the contents. The magazines talked about sexual assault, harassment, the pressure that girls are under to take and send nude photos of themselves, consent, and also news headlines featuring celebrities and politicians involved in misconduct. In an article about sexual harassment, a 17-year-old woman reflected on the first time that she had been harassed. She was 11 years old and in sixth grade. The boys in her class had created a hot or not list and it was circulated via Gmail chat for everyone to see. All of the sixth grade girls were judged on their appearance and body with both points and counterpoints listed. She said, I'd been aware of the concept of relative prettiness for a while. But this was the first time it actually been graded on our looks and it was pass fail and it was public. She went on to say, but none of us said anything. Instead, in the privacy of our own homes, we looked in our mirrors and had our first taste of self-hatred. Suddenly we weren't thinking about four square and handball anymore. It was, what do the boys think of how I look? We were 11, we gave those boys our power. The overarching theme noted in all four magazines were the contradictory messages that were presented to adolescent girls. There were both traditional gender norms and alternative femininities uh, encouraged throughout. So gendered expectations were contrasted with messages of empowerment and authenticity. Activism was portrayed as one way for girls to decrease their emotional distress, um, to help feelings of helplessness they may have, especially related to current events. Some ideas of these traditional gender norms were feel chill and totally relaxed. The trick, hug a guy. When females get a whiff of a male's hair or skin, they immediately feel relaxed. The scent had some sort of calming power on the brain. And another, put on some lipstick and pull yourself together. Don't pout pretty. No matter what you're stressing over, there's one tried and true trick when you need a kick of confidence. Apply a bold hue to bring out your inner boss, babe. So in addition to um, what I've discussed, part of my research framework was to look at what was missing, whose voices were not present or who was not represented. According to previous research, sexual and gender minorities continue to be at an increased risk for depression and suicidality. And although the data analyzed included some diversity within the adolescent girl population, um, SGM youth were greatly underrepresented and the discussion of sexuality or sexual orientation was very limited in all of the journals. Also, there were limited discussions of Latinx and Asian American women in the magazines, and this confined the breadth of my analysis regarding race and ethnicity and its relation to emotional distress. Magazines that directly target these populations, both Latinx and Asian American women, could not be located in my search. Also, um, largely whiteness was the assumed norm in all of the journals, meaning that race was only mentioned when speaking about people of color. And this is true even for the journal that targeted um, African-American young women as their audience. The phenomenon of invisible whiteness allows for privileges of the dominant race to go unnamed or remain unmarked. So what does this all mean? Well, as we go throughout our days today and we're social distancing, 
and we're, we're wearing masks to prevent the spread of COVID. I wanna encourage all of you to think about ways that you can help prevent the spread of emotional distress and suicide contagion through being proactive rather than reactive to the mental health epidemic. Some things that we can do um, are train nurses to perform depression and other mental health screenings in pediatric primary care to help support the needs of um, all adolescents. And also we need to expand the role of school nursing and school-based services to meet the needs of the increased distress that we're seeing. Nurses should be disseminating resources that create trauma-informed services to help identify adolescents that may already be distressed. Also, the importance of incorporating an intersectionality paradigm in nursing curriculum and all health professions curriculum would give the ability of educators and students to both address power dynamics and healthcare inequities. Nurses are also needed to combat stigma and this can be done both at the bedside, education and through research by changing the way that we speak about mental health. So changing the dialogue surrounding mental health issues and treatment. Nursing research can also offer alternatives to understanding emotional distress, um, alternatives to the biomedical model by centering adolescent girls in the care and planning of their own health and well-being, as opposed to purely focusing on biology. I want to thank everyone um, that gave me support during this journey. It was not a solitary effort, especially um, my family, my dissertation committee, um, other faculty members, and my cohort, and the funding sources that I received for which I would not be here if I would not have received those funds. So I thank you, and I'll take your questions at this time. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You've given us so much to think about here, a very important topic. Um, there's a question here from Terry Harvath, and she says, this is such a timely topic. I hope you get this published soon. <laughs> How do the events of the past couple of weeks influence your understanding of the significance of the topic? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think about both, you know, we have such a complicated situation we're living in with COVID and the social distancing. Um, and we know that through this time, that technology has increased it, social media um, with both you know, talking about COVID and also the recent events with um, the continued violence against especially people of color. And unfortunately, a lot of rumors also that I've noted and heard about on social media myself. And so when thinking about my research and how this was a great distress, especially for the girls of color specifically that were um, in my research, it really increased their depression and anxiety. And so I, you know, we're living in an unprecedented time and um, we really need to come together by making sure we can all do this by stop stopping the spread of rumors and supporting um, other communities and children besides our own and in our families. And so I think this is going to be, there's a lot of rich data here as well. And we need to explore this and see how the times that we're living in um, are affecting the emotional distress of, of young ones and especially of adolescent girls who have already seen a steep climb in depression and suicidality in the last decade. Thank you. So another question here from Angela Usher, what types of suggestions do you have for dealing with messaging from teen magazines? Mm, it's a great question. Actually, um, when I had this discussion with my uh, dissertation committee, they said, when are you gonna join the editorial board of these magazines <laughs> and um, you know, get some different information out there? And so I think that's one way, You know, I think nurses and other healthcare providers need to be involved more um, on the preventative side and step outside of the hospital setting that we're mostly in and into um, communities and in media more because we don't see enough of nurses. And when we do, nurses are completely, um, usually portrayed wrongly in media as to what we do. So definitely getting involved more in those activities and through our research, um, and also, of course, talking to our kids and other young ones about um, what we see from media, whether it's the news or popular culture, is um, those are cultural constructs. And um, talking about the importance of 
is it real and how it in, infects us? So we just need to keep the conversation going and we need to be involved more in, um, nursing needs to be involved more in having a voice in that arena as well. So uh, just one last question. Um, how did you go about selecting the magazines that you selected? And can you speak a little bit about the significance of those magazines to the population of young women today? I mean, is that something, is it a um, still a vehicle that they turn to? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So to answer the first part, um, I searched high and low and uh, wanted to base my selection off of um, a few different factors. So circulation figures definitely were a factor and 17 and girls life specifically from the four I selected had the biggest numbers. And those are the, the two that are both available in print and digital versions. So they're not just at stores, but they're all online as well. And I also wanted to make sure that I had a diverse sample. So Sessie Magazine um, directly targets the African-American um, adolescent girl population. And so I wanted to make sure that um, to, to get the diversity in um, race and ethnicity, which is one of the gaps that we examine that as well, um, as well as teen graffiti is a more um, diverse audience that it targets. And so that was a big piece. And then also the ability to obtain back issues was the third factor so that I could in fact have all the issues I needed to do this study. Um, magazines remain, according to the literature, very influential and um, some research shows that it's even more influential than the internet, especially print magazines because the fact that they can be saved by young women and read over and over again as opposed to the news um, and posts and things that may come across our screen on the internet and that may change daily. So each has their own um, devil, if you will, but um, magazines still remain very influential for young women according to previous literature and circulation figures. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer, and congratulations on a wonderful dissertation. Thank you very much. I'm gonna call our next uh, speaker who is Laurelyn Taylor, and her dissertation is titled Effects of Cannabis Legalization on Prenatal Use of Cannabis, Alcohol, and Tobacco. And her dissertation chair is Janice Bell. Thank you, dissertation chair, <laughs> Janice Bell. So I'm gonna, can everyone see my screen? Are we good? Yes, okay. So um, as Janice said, my name is Laurel and Taylor and I'm going to be presenting my dissertation research on the effects of cannabis legalization on the prenatal use rates of cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. And I'm just gonna start off by going over some background that helped inform my question and study. So currently under federal law, cannabis is a schedule one drug, meaning the federal government sees it as having a high abuse potential and safety concerns, and therefore does not allow cannabis for medicinal use and permits only limited research into the health effects of cannabis. However, states began to pass their own laws involving cannabis. And in 1996, California became the first state to legalize cannabis for medicinal use. And then in 2012, Colorado legalized cannabis for adult recreational use. And that's just continued to grow. So when I started the study back in 2016, uh, only four states had recreational legalization. Now 11 have recreational and medical legalization and 22 states have medical legalization. So this is a rapidly evolving policy. And the reason it could be um, an issue for public health and health sciences is we know that legalization of substances impacts use. So specifically for medical legalization, after it occurs, we see an uptick in adult use of uh, cannabis. And then we also see a spillover effect onto use of other substances. For example, one study looked at medical legalization and found that among pregnant women, there was an increase in admission to alcohol abuse treatment centers during pregnancy following medical legalization. And that's a concern, particularly among vulnerable populations like pregnant women, where prenatal substance use can affect not only the health of the mother, but also of the developing fetus. So that brings me to where are we with prenatal substance use? So currently cannabis is the most commonly illicit used drug during pregnancy with six to 10% of women reporting use. That's followed by tobacco, which is obviously a legal drug. So alcohol and tobacco are also commonly used at 10 and 12%. And the reason this is of concern is particularly for cannabis and tobacco. We know that exposure during pregnancy can lead to low infant birth weight, which can have consequences both right after birth and later on in life. And then all three of these substances, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis 
are all shown to have an impact on cognitive development of the fetus. Particularly if you think about alcohol, there's, it's well studied that alcohol use during pregnancy can lead to alcohol, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So taking that into account how policy affects behavior and the impact of substance use during pregnancy, it brought me to this question. Given how cannabis legalization is changing and is likely to move forward, how does cannabis legalization impact the use of not only cannabis, but also alcohol and tobacco during pregnancy, as well as factors associated with cannabis use during pregnancy? And for my dissertation, I conducted a secondary data analysis combining cross-sectional data from the 2009 to 2017 Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, better known as PRAMS. And it's a population-based survey given by the CDC in collaboration with 38 states, and it's given six to 12 weeks postpartum and asks women questions about a variety of behaviors and experiences during pregnancy. These answers are then tied to the birth certificate data from those uh, women's babies, and it's better used to understand the mother infant health outcomes. Also, because the birth certificate data is tied to states where these babies were born, we can look at how certain state policies might impact maternal behaviors and fetal health. Um, for my statistical design, I use something called differences and differences analysis, which I'll go over shortly on the next slide, logistic regression and descriptive statistics. And then for my outcome variables, I looked at alcohol use prior, three months prior to pregnancy, alcohol use during pregnancy, tobacco use prior to pregnancy, tobacco use during pregnancy, heavy alcohol use, and then cannabis use uh, prior to pregnancy, during pregnancy, and postpartum. And you might be wondering why we would look at use prior to pregnancy. The reason being that about 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. So there is a strong possibility that women might use substances prior to knowing they are pregnant and therefore exposing the fetus early on. And I did a two paper dissertation. So I'm gonna go over the findings for both papers and then talk about what they mean together. So for my first paper, I wanted to compare the prevalence rates of alcohol and tobacco use among pregnant women and how that is associated with cannabis legalization. And the way I did that is using something called a differences and differences analysis. It uh, is a statistical analysis that actually comes from economics and it allows you to see how policy might impact behavior. And the way we do that is you look at prevalence rates of these behaviors in a treatment and control group. So in this case, it was a recreational state compared to a non-legal state or a medical state compared to a non-legal state. And then you look at um, that after the policy and you subtract. So it, you subtract each from each other, which is why it's called differences and differences. And it allows you to see the impact of the policy on behavior. So for this paper, I found a 1% increase in prenatal alcohol use, um, and it was statistically significant. I also, and that was in recreational states. And then I also found that cigarette use was decreasing overall, but it was decreasing at a lower rate in any state that had passed medical or recreational legalization. So what does this all mean? You're probably thinking 1% doesn't seem like a lot. Well, if you consider that in our sample alone, we had about 200,000 women, that would be 2,000 pregnancies exposed to alcohol, 2,000 more pregnancies exposed to alcohol or tobacco following legalization. And if we expand that to the entire, uh, all the states where these pregnancies were, all the states sampled for this, that would be about 20,000 pregnancies or fetuses potentially exposed to substances. So for paper two, I did a, a more descriptive paper and I examined the prevalence of cannabis use across the prenatal period. So prior to conception, during the prenatal period and postpartum, I also wanted to look at the co-use of tobacco and cannabis in this group. And importantly, I wanted to see for what we know for the first time, how e-cigarettes plays into that. So previously e-cigarettes had not been included in a tobacco indicator, but because e-cigarettes are an emerging and very popular trend, I thought it would be important to include them in the tobacco indicator and see how that affects co-use, especially because we know vaping is a very common way to use THC. So it stands to reason that if a woman is co-using, she's gonna be using nicotine and uh, cannabis together. I also wanted to identify factors associated with use during these times. And then I just have some basic uh, percentages just to show that this goes along with what I talked about in the beginning with 6% of our sample using during pregnancy and 11% before and 8% after. So what I found was during the preconception period, um, so I should just have said, sorry. So some of the things I looked at the characteristics associated with use, I looked at adequacy of prenatal care. I also looked at how residence in a medical or recreational state affects is associated with use. And what I found is that prior to pregnancy, 
women who lived in a medical or recreational state had a statistically significantly higher odds of using cannabis. I also found that being under the age of 25 was associated with use during this period, being unmarried, using tobacco, and having inadequate prenatal care were all associated with use. During the prenatal and postpartum period, I also found that residents in a recreational state was significantly associated with increased odds of use, and that was also true in the postpartum period. Across these two time periods, we also found that age, marital status, tobacco use, and alcohol use, as well as inadequate prenatal care were all associated with cannabis use during this time. So I've kind of done a death by data and given you a lot of data. So you're probably wondering, what does this all mean? So I'm gonna focus on the big takeaways and include from other research why this might be happening. So one potential mechanism is that the observed change in the perception of harm of cannabis legalization could have spillover effects onto other substances. So as we legalize a, a schedule one drug, perhaps the perception of harm of cannabis decreases and therefore the perception of other harms of other substances also decreases and therefore use increases. Importantly, this is the first study to my knowledge to look at the effect of recreational cannabis legalization on use of other substances. So while there's not a lot of literature to support my findings, it is novel and we can look at other studies of medical cannabis legalization to back up what we found. Um, it's also possible that as we, as cannabis legalization occurs, providers shift to talking about cannabis and the effects on pregnancy and shift away from talking about alcohol and tobacco. When cannabis education for pregnancy is brand new, there's been a lot of attention toward it, but we haven't really updated tobacco and alcohol education in pregnancy in the past 15 years. The biggest takeaway is that both medical and recreational legalization are associated with an increase in alcohol use and a slower decrease in tobacco use among pregnant women. To continue, there appears to be a difference between recreational legalization and cannabis legalization and the associated use rates in pregnancy. So on that slide, two slides ago, I talked about how recreational legalization or living in a state with recreational legalization was associated with use across all three time periods. It's possible that the sheer fact of having recreational legalization might increase access through dispensaries, right? Because for medical legalization, you might have a limited list of conditions that allow you to get medical cannabis, but for recreational cannabis, anybody can get it. It's also possible that providers might vary the information they give based on the state in which they live. So one study found uh, clinicians were much more likely to focus on the legality of cannabis if they lived in a state without legalization. And then when the state become, became recreational, they didn't have that to focus on. So they sort of ignored the topic together altogether. Uh, importantly, the characteristics we found associated with use are common across the literature and tobacco use in, and then we all, I also want to point out that tobacco use should include, tobacco use indicators and in research should include e-cigarettes moving forward because that was found to be associ associated with cannabis use. So now that I talked about my findings, what should we do moving forward? So specifically for public health, we may want to consider the addition of uh, substance use screening to the U.S. Prevent Preventative Task Force. So there are a set of questions for pregnant women, but substance use is not included in there. We also might want to consider better surveillance. So as I said, this is only in 38 states. We may want to consider expanding this to all 50 states and find a national way to monitor this, whether it be through EHR or some other or electronic health record or some other way. Then specifically for clinical practice, we want to have health education and screening for pregnant, pregnant women that emphasizes all substances and not just alcohol or not just tobacco, not just cannabis. We should also modify screenings so that we talk to women about substance use during pregnancy at all points of the reproductive cycle. Meaning if a woman comes into her primary care provider and is not using birth control or is at risk of becoming pregnant, we talk to her then since again, we know 50% of pregnancies in this country are unplanned. Also, clinicians should use clear definitions of smoking and cannabis use because of these new and emerging trends like e-cigarettes and the co-use. So if you ask a woman, are you smoking? She might be thinking of smoking a traditional tobacco product and not think about her vape pen. Finally, for policies, we might want to advocate for the addition of prevention funding or requirements for pro provider training or dispensary worker training following, following legalization. We know dispensary workers are giving information to women, pregnant women about cannabis use. So as we move forward with legalization, which is likely to happen given the trends, we want to uh, make sure that everybody involved with pregnant women has the proper training to give the correct education. So I just want to take a moment to thank uh, my dissertation committee and my chair, Dr. Janice Bell, my graduate advisor and Dr. Dan Marie Garcia, my family, my mom, uh, my husband, Andrew, my son, Warren, my brother, and my doggies. 
um, and then my wonderful cohort and to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for the excellent educational opportunities. And finally, for my dad, who unfortunately did not get to live to see this journey complete, but uh, told me to forget medical school and get my PhD. And that's the best advice he's ever given me. So thank you. And I will take questions. Thank you, Laura Lynn. That was a great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions already. Um, the first one is from Jennifer Holt and asks, how can dispensaries be held accountable or receive information on how to counsel pregnant women who seek their advice on using marijuana when pregnant for nausea? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so one thing that could happen is because there is no federal oversight, one advantage is that states have a lot of power in the policies they pass, and so do counties. So one thing that counties could do is that in order to give a dispensary their license, they could require that all uh, dispensary workers have training about um, if a pregnant woman calls and asks for you know, information about using cannabis during pregnancy that you need to refer them first to a, physician, a provider, a medical professional. Um, that's, that's the main thing. We could also advocate for more labeling like on edibles and you know, with alcohol, when you walk into any place that serves alcohol, there's a Surgeon General's warning that says, um, you know, alcohol is known to cause fetal harm. And while the federal government's not going to do that, California is in a unique position because we are the first state to have our own Surgeon General. So she could, Dr. Nadine Burke could say she's going to issue a statement and have that posted in all cannabis dispensaries. Thanks. And were you able to look at any differences by race or ethnicity with alcohol use during pregnancy? I was. Um, so I had, uh, you know, the general five uh, race ethnicities. So um, white, uh, black, white, white, non or Hispanic, non-white, um, Asian, uh, and then uh, a mixed race category. And then I also had the Alaska Native um, Pacific Islander were grouped together. And what's interesting is that alcohol use in particular wasn't associated with any increased use, although um, in the recreational states, we, Alaska Native was uh, statistically, statistically significantly associated with alcohol use. However, I'll put a little asterisk next to that. Alaska is one of the four states in this study that had recreational legalization, so that could be a confounding factor just because they're going to have a higher population, but that was the only race group to be found to be statistically significantly associated with alcohol use. Thank you. And did your research look at any of the positive benefits of cannabis use during pregnancy, like for nausea or vomiting? No, so I didn't actually, for this study, I didn't look at any um, reasons why women used cannabis during pregnancy. I was only looking at the prevalence rates of use. So I didn't look at why they use, but that's a really important question. And I think, um, as we move forward, that's something we should look at and um, stay tuned because I have a poster coming out at the uh, American Journal of Public Health that will go over something similar to that. So yeah, it will be, it hopefully will be researched, but um, just currently it looks like women who use cannabis probably use to mitigate stress and, and not as much for nausea. And one more question. So during the prenatal period, women often experience nausea. Do you think that the increased use in cannabis has any association with this? Could it show, could this show undertreated issues that pregnant mothers are addressing through outside means? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great question. I, I agree. Um, and like I said, I think there needs to be further inquiry into that because based on my very small sample that I did not report on this or in my dissertation, it, it looked like women were reporting use for stress or for fun. However, I know that other studies have found women are using for um, nausea. And that's why one of the recommendations is to train providers on other safer methods for women to use. So if they come in um, and, and disclose that they're using cannabis to train their provider to talk in a way that's non-judgmental and offer pregnancy safe alternatives for nausea. Um, but it's gonna take both treatment and protocols for providers um, or training, training and protocols for providers to, to get that ball rolling. All right, thank you very much, Laura Lynn, thank and you. congratulations. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bill Randall and his dissertation is titled, How ICU Nurses Conceive of Personal and Professional Risk when exercising clinical autonomy. And his dissertation chair is Esther Carolina Apazoa Verano. Good morning. Let me just share my screen here. Let 
many, no matter how many times you practice this, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Um, anyways, I'm Bill Randall and good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you this morning. I'm a PhD graduate from Betty Irene uh, Moore School of Nursing. So this morning, I'd like to talk to you about something near and dear to my heart, and that's how ICU nurses conceive of personal and professional risk when they're exercising clinical autonomy. Uh, my years in the ER, ICU, flight nursing, and trauma unit uh, really set me up for success. But during those 36 years, despite working with a great degree of autonomy, I felt like I was sometimes taking risks. So nursing today in the onset of the pandemic has really come to the forefront. We realize how nurses are really pivotal to nursing outcomes and patient outcomes, and not to mention the baby boomers who are growing older and people are just living longer with uh, more comorbidities. So what is clinical autonomy? Uh, it's the freedom to do what is in the patient's best interest based on the nurse's professional judgment, despite opposing pressure from institutional authorities or disagreement with members of other professions. We all know that as nurses often work hard at the bedside that not everything they do is covered by a rule, a policy or a doctor's order. Sometimes that means bending the rules a bit and migrating a bit out of formal a jurisdiction, that area that they migrate to could cause them uh, to incur increased risk. So one of the underlying premises of my work has to do with the natural inherent overlap of nurses and physicians in their practice domain. Even the California Nurse Practice Act acknowledges the evolution of nursing practice and how there is a natural overlap that shows even more so how nurses and physicians need to collaborate. So nurses are tasked with being professional, to being autonomous, to taking really good care of their patients, but they are never 100% control, in control over their own work. Nurses are inherently subordinate to both administrators and physicians. This puts them in a gray zone of vulnerability as they try to take really good care of their patients. So one study I wanted to highlight was by Rao. This study looked at over 20,000 nurses in 570 hospitals. It found that for every one point increase in an autonomy scale, there were 18% lower odds of death or failure to rescue. Quite a phenomenal uh, data point and a really robust, rigorous study. So how did I study this? I looked at grounded theory, which is a qualitative method. Uh, qualitative research uh, is very appropriate. Although there was plentiful research on clinical autonomy, how it related to risk was virtually non-existent. So this, this format to study uh, the research question was really appropriate. I wanted to look at nuanced, uh, intricate things that you could not possibly pick up on a questionnaire. So I did a robust uh, recruitment verse uh, through Facebook and the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, as well as posting flyers that led to my data collection, 27 in-depth interviews with some amazing and richly diverse nurses from all, all over Northern California. That resulted in my data analysis, basically going through over 1,200 pages of transcripts and coding them for recurrent themes and just figuring out what does it all mean? What is in the data? One thing that's true of grounded theory is a constant comparison where despite uh, other methods like quantitative. Qualitative really goes back. Does the data analysis reflect the data collection? Is there more recruitment we needed to do in order to sort of flesh out some of those concepts? So what were the results? I tried to 
hone down on the main ones. So how did nurses define clinical autonomy? You know, nurses did not speak about risks that often. More so, they talked about their robust and their abundant clinical autonomy. They're really proud of it. And nursing has really evolved, um, as I found. So having a presence, meaning they were able to be heard and have a voice was really powerful, as well as feeling empowered themselves. Uh, one nurse said, there is so much, uh, there is such an emphasis on collegiality and having nurses be in the circle during ICU rounds. Our voice is valued and that makes us stronger in our profession. Uh, empowerment also translated to just being able to speak up uh, to anybody who, who was, uh, as they call, disruptive behavior. Anybody who disparages a nurse, discounts them, or basically uh, does not include them in part of the decision making. So context also played a huge role. Um, context is essentially the clinical practice environment for the nurse. There were many factors that seemed to promote clinical autonomy. On the left, we have the white male nurse who's experienced at a major teaching hospital on the day shift with supportive physicians, managers, and resources. Compare that with the African-American female nurse, a newer graduate working the night shift at a community hospital, the docs at home asleep, the manager may not be as involved in their limited resources. Now, one may say, well, it makes sense that the one on the left would have greater autonomy, but consider those night nurses without a physician around with perhaps delays in contacting them and how autonomous they really had to be. Plus in community hospitals, nurses tend to have closer relationships with providers since there were fewer of them. So nurses exercise clinical autonomy in a variety of methods. For the most part, nurses had a wonderful collaborative relationship with providers and others. Uh, they relied on their established trust and they were able to assert themselves in, in decision making. However, there were those that dealt with uh, disruptive behavior from providers and others. To avoid conflict, nurses resorted to playing the uh, long-sided doctor-nurse game where nurses would often uh, make suggestions while making it seem like it was the doctor's idea or just delaying communication. Finally, nurses as being um, ingrained in the system knew how to work the system. They were able to circumvent providers, for example, going from one provider to another in order to avoid conflict, but also to get the order they needed or the change in the patient's course they felt was appropriate. Likewise, banding together as nurses or just referring any bit of conflict up to the managers. So how did ICU nurses really conceive of risk, the main question? Overwhelmingly, legal liability was their concern. They were worried about getting in trouble with the board. Um, one nurse said, we can be as autonomous as we want, but it all must be within that scope of practice. So I just stay in my own lane. Uh, nurses were worried about getting in trouble, but overwhelmingly, nurses only migrated into that other area of rule bending when they were responsible. They knew that whatever rules they might have bent, it was things they were comfortable doing, was things that they knew had low risk, and it was things they knew would uh, enhance the patient. Employer scrutiny was another issue. Uh, due to greater regulation, uh, nurses are under increased pressure from their employers to toe the line. Uh, this quote says, administrators just want you to get in line and follow the rules. They don't want us to think, but if we follow the rules, patients would die because people don't know what rules to make. Another problem was physician-related risk. Um, as mentioned, some uh, physicians didn't always play well in the sandbox and there was some disruptive behavior. The nurses didn't always articulate that as risk, but in reality, it was a really prevalent underlying problem at some places. 
Um, that risk involved having interprofessional conflict. Imagine if a physician was uh, yelling at you or dismissed you as being dumb, how likely you would be to speak up about a patient concern. Finally, the risk of not acting. Again, nurses didn't talk about this as a risk, but uh, when nurses don't do what they need to do in a critical situation, patients suffer. This quote was, when we're taking care of your loved ones, you're gonna want a nurse like me that's going to say, get out of my way, because I, I have to save this life, instead of someone who just sits in the corner and does what everyone else tells them to do. So in discussion, I'd like to talk about that same nurse. Uh, nurses, through these strategies, are somehow able to care well for their patients and balance that oppression that they sometimes feel from administrators and physicians. Overwhelmingly, nurses cited being patient advocates as their motivation. But one must look at this from a broader uh, lens and consider nurses doing what they needed to do. Were they, in a way, usurping some of the power that others were putting on them? So nurses really strive. They just wanted to feel good at the end of the day. They wanted to take control. And they wanted to feel like a true professional. Finally, I'd like to thank my dissertation chair, Dr. Carolina Apiso Barano, my committee, and numerous other people. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what you plan to do with this work to move it forward at this point? Sure. So um, obviously, I want to publish my work. I think there's a couple of venues to do that. Um, sociological uh, uh, magazines are appropriate as well as um, magazines like uh, Journal of Nursing Administration. Um, I don't wanna curtail nurses work. What I wanna do is expose some of the vulnerabilities and the gray zones that put nurses at risk. I think physicians in particular need to understand nurses roles and how clinical autonomy really augments uh, patient outcomes. And overwhelmingly, nurses want to work together with others. They don't want to be in charge and sort of take over anyone's uh, lead. They want to be part of the decision making. So I think uh, promoting that in policy work, as well as just having conversations with people in the community. Thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we might instill the importance of clinical autonomy in nursing students, even if they're not yet ready for that autonomy? So that's very true. Uh, nurses were uh, less willing to take risks if they had little experience. So that was a good thing. We don't want new graduates uh, doing anything um, that might put them or patients at risk. So um, as a nursing instructor, I'm always uh, making nurses aware of their role. Um, I always tell them, never say I'm just a nurse. It's say that physicians are experts in medicine, and guess what? Nurses are expert at nursing. And together, we come together to improve patient care and to take good care of our patients. So uh, I think clinical autonomy needs to be fostered. Nurses need to feel like they can speak up. And again, I promote that in my students. I encourage them to ask questions, to have ideas. We have a question about how you minimize bias in how you analyze the data because you come from that particular background. So that's a great point. Um, bias was huge, right? Because I have my own ideas, my own experience. Um, I always tried to stay true to what participants said. Um, it was really hard. I got to talking during interviews and probably talked way too much, uh, sharing uh, war stories. But in a way that helped augment the nurses' freedom to just talk openly and to really share some of their intimate thinking about their work. Um, so I always looked at the data. I went back and looked at transcripts and I even re-listened to some of the tapes. I wanted to make sure that nurses' words uh, rang true. And as one professor told me, let the data speak. So I was always conscious of that and always worried about um, injecting my own biases into my interpretation. 
So last question is, um, how can ICU, ICU nurses in particular navigate the balance between following protocols and exercising autonomy? So nurses who did not always follow protocols exactly, um, they always did it with the implicit or explicit uh, approval by physicians and managers. That was, that was key. So I think nurses need to uh, speak up for themselves, make sure that the policies, procedures, and even the legislation supports their role and supports their being able to work into their fullest extent. Uh, I was surprised the Nurse Practice Act actually is gray enough that it, it uh, really allows nurses to work um, at their highest potential. There's not a lot of restrictions um, detailed and that's a good thing. Um, so I think nurses, especially ICU nurses, they usually don't have a problem being outspoken. Um, I think a different study looking at nurses not in the ICU would really uh, reveal some other uh, results. Thanks so much, Bill, and congratulations on really important work. Great, thank you so much. Uh, our next, our final speaker actually is Cindy Matsumoto and her dissertation is titled Social Support and Health in Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender and Queer People. Her dissertation chair is Katherine Kim. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today um, about sexual and gender minorities, social networks, and health. Um, you might be familiar with acronym LGBTQIA+, to refer to a group of people, and um, I want to inter introduce you to the term sexual and gender minorities um, to refer to the same group of people. And if you were watching Jennifer's um, presentation, you have heard this term already, so that's fantastic. I think it's important to understand that there are differences between sexual minorities and gender minorities. So cisgender, pe cisgender refers to people whose gender ident identity aligns with their assigned sex at birth in the binary uh, male-female paradigm. And so um, gender minorities fall under the umbrella of transgender and they include people who are transgender and people who are non-binary. Sexuality and sexual orientation distinguish sexual minorities and is based on attraction, behavior, and identity. And the umbrella term um, sexual minorities is used for people who are not heterosexual. So um, in compared to the general population, the um, literature available on sexual and gender minorities is um, sparse. And so there's national efforts to expend, expand that research. And in um, 2010, there was um, a report on the health um, of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And in that report, there was um, a model, a minority stress model presented. So um, Dr. Meyer in 2003 came up with the minority stress model. And I'm only going to talk about a little bit of it. Um, and basically it says there's general stressors and that, re that lead to mental health outcomes. And in addition to those general health stressors, there are um, stressors related to being a sexual um, minority. And so there are, there are stressors that are distal, so more like in the social environment, things like discrimination and violence, and that also leads to health outcomes, mental health outcomes. And then there are, are other stressors that are more proximal, like um, the expectation of rejection for being a sexual minority or concealment or being out, um, that also leads to mental health outcomes. And Dr. Meyer's model has been extended to include, include physical health outcomes. And it's important to study health, um, the health of sexual gender minorities because there is a very high rate of depression there's worse overall health, and there's higher risky health behaviors in that population. So back to the model, um, Dr. Meyer said, um, there is a way to influence the relationship between stress and mental health outcomes, and that's with coping and social support. So there's a lot of literature that shows that an increase in social support decreases, um, improves mental health outcomes. 
But what we don't know is um, the details about that social support. Um, and so one way to get those details is through a methodology called egocentric social networks. And what this is, is you, the research participant, is in the middle. Um, the researchers ask questions um, like who, who provides you support and they ask, you know, what kind of support. So then you answer who provides you support. Um, and once you have that list of people, then um, they ask specific questions about each of those people. So what's the relationship of that person to you? What's their gender, race, and ethnicity? So demographic information they also ask. And then um, how do you keep in touch and how frequently do you keep in touch? and um, how close do you feel to that person? So the, this methodology provides the detail information about um, the, the um, social networks. So I was very fortunate that there was a study done out of UC Berkeley um, called UCNet, and they collected this egocentric social network data. And the goal of the study was to observe changes in egocentric social networks in response to life changes. There were 1,159 participants, and they had both a younger cohort and an older cohort. And they collected a variable on sexual orientation, which was very fortunate for me. So the purpose of this study was to understand egocentric social networks and their relationships to health and sexual minorities. And I just want to point out that there was a decrease in my scope um, from sexual and gender minorities to sexual minorities because information about gender identity wasn't collected. So my aim one was to characterize and compare the egocentric social networks of sexual minorities and non-sexual minorities in both a younger and an older cohort. So um, in the younger cohort, um, there were statistically significant differences and some of those are that younger um, sexual minorities have fewer relatives their networks have a, a more diverse um, race and ethnicity, um, and they don't feel as close to their network members as the younger non-sexual minorities. So when you look at the networks of older sexual minorities versus non-sexual minorities, you'll see a lot of the same, um, the same um, trends. So there are fewer relatives, their networks have a little more um, racial diversity, and they don't feel as close. The other difference is that in older sexual minorities, they have more non-relative friends in their group. So there are differences between social networks of sexual minorities and non-sexual minorities. So my aim too was to examine if social network characteristics are associated with depression and poor health in the older cohort. So I use the same data set, but I only use the older cohort. And so um, there are social network characteristics that are associated with a decrease in depression. Um, that's relatives providing socializing support, um, non-relative friends providing socializing support, and network members of the same race and ethnicity. So if you look at then the, the differences in social networks between sexual minorities and non-sexual minorities, um, sexual minorities have fewer relatives providing socializing support than non-sexual minorities and um, sexual minorities have fewer network members of the same race and ethnicity, which could, could affect depression. Um, and then there are also um, social network characteristics associated with better overall health, and that's feeling especially close and frequent electronic contact. And then when you look at the network characteristics of sexual uh, minorities versus non-sexual minorities, um, sexual minorities feel less close to their network than non-sexual minorities. And I have to say in this time of um, COVID that um, f um, frequent electronic contact um, leading to better overall health was um, very interesting to me. Um, and so I say what you need to do is you need to text, you need to email, you need to FaceTime, you need to keep in contact electronically. So my implications, um, Health is not is a state of complete um, physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And I, I want to. I, I, it's important to understand that it's physical, mental, and social. Um, and my study had all of those components. Um, my study extended the knowledge of social networks of a marginalized population. 
and it reinforces the need to disaggregate the study populations by sexual orientation and not just assume heterosexual and disaggregate by gender identity and not just assume cisgender and binary. And so I'm going to do a little plug for the PRIDE study. Um, if you are a sexual or, gen or gender minority, um, the PRIDE study, uh, and want to be involved in research, the PRIDE study is um, a, a cohort of over 30,000 sexual and gender minorities and uh, answering questions that are not available in other studies. Um, so a big thanks to my dissertation and qualifying exam committees. I could not have done this without you. So here's my dissertation committee, and then here's my qualifying exam committee. Thank you for your patience and your support. Um, and then um, I want to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation because I could not have done this without them. Um, and it takes a village. And so here is my social network. Um, I always start like tearing up at this, but I want to thank everybody. I couldn't have done this without you um, and my dedication. To everyone who does not fit into the binary heterosexual box, when you feel alone or are lonely, trust that your people are out there. Reach out, find them. You are not alone. So a quote by Janet Mock, a trailblazing storyteller and transgender rights activist, she said in the Get It Gets Better project, surround yourself with people who validate and affirm your identity and your truth. And that's it. Cindy, thank you so much. Um, just to start off the questioning, could you talk a little bit about that data set? Uh, the title said something about in response to life changes. So what, what, would, what kind of life changes was that about and how does that affect, affect how you interpret the findings? Um, so that's a great question. It actually is a three wave. It's a, it's a longitudinal panel um, survey. And so I only used wave one data. So they are, um, they are going to look at um, the changes like um, retirement or having children or moving. Um, so there are different changes they want to see if, if um, egocentric social networks change over time. Um, and um, one thing that would have made my study stronger is if I would have been able to study stress and compare it to the outcome, um, but they only collected stress starting in wave two. So I wasn't able to do that. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit about how health care providers can support sexual and gender minorities by addressing their social networks and support systems? Absolutely. Um, so uh, when people, um, I'm going to go hospital, it, um, when people are in the hospital and they are being discharged, um, and they have somebody in the room that's of the same gender, um, don't assume that that's like their family member. Um, and I also think that you need to, um, as nurses, we need to look and see who's gonna support the person when they get home. Do they have somebody to get them um, food? Do they have somebody to go get their medications? So I think um, it, it, it's imperative to know what the support system is and who's in their network um, to, for health. Great. Our, our next que question is, are you planning to have this study published? I am planning on having this study published. It's going to be two publications, actually. Um, the first one is uh, um, the differences between the social networks of um, sexual minorities and non-sexual minorities, because that hasn't been done before. And then the second one is about the, the um, egocentric social network characteristics associated with health. And I, I wish that I only had 67 sexual minorities. So I wish I could have done the analysis with the um, with that group um, and to see exactly what is associated with um, depression and um, overall health in that group. But I didn't have enough people. But but the pride study, um, you know, they have a lot of people. So perhaps that could be my next step. That sounds great. Um, how should we incorporate knowledge of sexual and gender minority health into nursing and health profession curriculum? Um, uh, I think that uh, um, Jennifer mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of times assumptions are made. If, if, if somebody is 
um, of a color than it's mentioned. If it's not mentioned, it's assumed white. And so I think that's the same with sexual and gender minorities. I think you you can't just make assumptions um, that everybody is heterosexual or um, or uh, you know adheres to the binary um, uh, male female paradigm. And I think that um, like there are different groups of sexual and gender minorities, right? It's not just gay and lesbians. There's bisexuals and there's people who have multiple partners. So I think that you really need to take that into consideration and, you know, meet people where they are. Thanks so much. So our last question is from Victoria No, and it's, hi, Cindy, great presentation. <laughs> studies that showed frequent social network increased depression. What are the different types of social contact online that may be considered supportive? Um, so what they asked about was um, texting, um, email, and other forms. Um, they didn't get into specifics about other type, but um, I know that in the in the sexual and gender um, literature, they um, there's information that um, because sometimes feel people feel alone, people reach out and make connections to people like them over the internet. You're, through so social media. And so I think that, that, that there needs to be more work on that for sure. All right, thank you so much. Um, so this brings thank us to you. the end of our symposium session. And I wanna thank all of the speakers this morning for terrific presentations. And I think you can see how they're all very mission relevant and relevant to the core values here in our school. I wanna say on behalf of the faculty and staff in the school, congratulations to each and every one of you. And to all of you in the audience, I appreciate you joining us and your engaged participation through the question and answer feature. And I'd like to enjoy, uh, invite you to join us again at 1130 to hear from our Master Science and Nursing Leadership students. They're going to be presenting posters from their Community Connections projects. And I know that's going to be a terrific session. So I hope you'll all just sign right back in. So thank you again and enjoy the day.